Hello, everybody. Thanks for attending today at the webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about submeter data collection on a budget. Um, now, I want you to think, think about what a budget means. Everybody has a budget, and the, those budgets are going to be just a little bit different for everyone. And so we're going to provide a variety of solutions uh, that should meet just about everybody's needs, depending on what kind of budget you have. So keep an open mind. Ask us questions as you need to, and hopefully this will be helpful for you today. Uh, my name is Ken Sim. I'm a natural resources sales and account manager. Um, I've worked in natural resources most of my career and happy to be here and happy to share a little bit of my knowledge with you. With me today is John Florio. How are you doing, Ken? Uh, my name is John Florio. I'm here with uh, Ken. I've been with Juniper Systems for a while. Uh, my education is actually in archaeology, but I've been in the geospatial technology world for about 25 years now, delivering products and solutions to people. So today we're going to be talking about submeter accuracy, kind of what it means and why it's important. We're going to be talking about some of the equipment that can be used um, that meets various budgets. Uh, that includes the geo GPS receiver and some of our UNSA data collection and mapping software. And we're going to be talking about meeting budgets with the right tools. It turns out that that's pretty important. And we're going to go over some hardware hacks, tips, and tricks. And um, then we're going to take some, some live questions and answers, and we'll see what we can come up, come up with for you. So just a reminder that we are with Juniper Systems. Uh, Juniper Systems is a manufacturer of very rugged hardware. Um, we produce uh, tablets and data collectors, submeter GPS units, and we've even uh, got some software that we, we, we put out there called the UNTA software. So, um, that's some of the perspective that we're going to be coming out with you today. We're happy to be here and we'll get going. All right. <clears throat> so why are we talking about submeter accuracy? In this presentation, we're going to be talking about various technologies, various accuracies. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to capture data out there. Some people have needs down to the centimeter. Some people have needs of just knowing where a building or a field is. But we're going to focus on the needs for a lot of the users who are logged in today. And as Ken likes to call this, this is burrows and boreholes. This is finding things that are smaller than three feet in size. You might want to locate uh, endangered species. You may want to be locating some test holes on a project. And you may want to be able to, be able to go back to those sites at different times of year, different seasons. So this is why we talk about submeter, because we want you to get to the objects that you've captured, not just the field for the objects that captured, because we want you to be efficient. So what is submeter? Obviously, it's less than a meter. Typically, a submeter solution is something in one to two foot range, or about 60 centimeters. We like to call it the Goldilocks zone, because this covers the majority of objects people are trying to locate, either temporary or permanent objects when they're doing mapping projects. It's just right. It's just right. If it's a bigger object than that, then it's not gonna be a point that you're capturing, it's gonna be a line like a road, or it's gonna be a, an area or polygon like a building or a field. But you still wanna capture that data at the submeter level so that you can return to that data later in the future. So this example here in this picture, we're just showing uh, an image on a satellite photo of an object that someone might want to map. And I want to give you a representation of what 60 centimeters looks like in the real world. That object is actually 70 centimeters to a side. And when I show the next slide, you might be able to guess what that object is. If anyone has an idea, go ahead and throw it into the, uh, into the chat later. And then the red circle around that is just giving you an idea of what a one meter radius is or three feet. So if we zoom out, we see we have a blue circle here. Now that blue circle is 15 meters. Now the reason we're showing that is because that's the typical blue dot you see on a smartphone. If you go into a mapping application on your phone and you zoom in, that little blue dot that looks like you're right in your house or right on the road, that's actually about 15 meter reliability or accuracy. And something else to know about that purple circle there, if you're using assisted GPS, or if your smartphone doesn't have a GPS receiver in it, it's just relying on corrections from cell towers 
or maybe Wi-Fi, the best you're going to get is more in that 45 meter range. So you're now looking at something where you could locate the Washington Monument, but you couldn't necessarily locate that little object next to the Washington Monument. And sure, that's easy in a nice open park like the mall in Washington, D.C., but what if you're in a heavy, dense scrub where you're trying to locate some burrows or some boreholes that you, you uh, drilled six months prior and the terrain has changed? You're going to need something that's going to be able to give you a submeter solution. So Juniper Systems, we make a technology that does that. We have a product called the Geode. The Geode is an all-in-one submeter receiver. It's real-time. It's a single-frequency receiver. When we say all in one, that means the receiver, the antenna, the battery, everything is enclosed in the housing. One button to push and turn on, turn off, and it's very easy to use. The accuracy is 60 centimeters 2D RMS, which means 95% or better reliability. We like to quote conservative reliable numbers. You'll see some products are promoted out there. They may say that they're sub foot and their specifications say 30 centimeters. Well, that's 30 centimeters RMS, or 63 to 67% of the time. But what about that extra third of your data? So we try to give you a good reliable number that we know the points are gonna fall in. We're gonna show some data that also that demonstrates that. A nice feature of the geode is it doesn't require a subscription. You just turn it on and you're ready to go. Uh, you can also use other forms of correction. You could use entrip corrections, which depending on how you use that and the distance to your base, you may even get better than that at 60 centimeter to the RMS. Uh, the data from the geode can also be post-processed. There's a number of applications out there that will interface with geode for post-processing. And lastly, it's a multi-platform product. It works on win with Windows devices, with Android devices. You can connect to an iPhone or iPad. It's designed to be a universal, real-world, real-time sub-meter data capturing tool. And the reason we're talking about that again is the customers that use this product, the professionals who are out there doing professional mapping, a consumer device might help them find where they need to do their work, but it's not going to help them find the information that they need to capture as part of their work. On the left, that blue dot, that's the consumer device accuracy you might get from, say, a smartphone. On the right, that's several points that were captured with the geo all its submeter accuracy. And you start to see when you throw this data into your mapping software or into a report that you send to someone that it's, uh, it's noticeable when you change from a submeter product to a consumer GPS device. So here's an example. This is static data. This is where we have gone and captured individual points right outside of our building here, like you saw in that previous image. And we captured 100 points and 93% of these fell within a one foot radius circle. So that gives you a good representation that the geode is capable of uh, very reliably achieving sub meter precision. So that's good for static points, but what about if you have to capture a trail or a road? We also did some dynamic testing. This is uh, just a residential area. We just walked around with the product. The red line was just a, in this instance, it was an iPhone XR. You'll notice there's a lot of drift in that path and sometimes it's 30 feet or more off of the sidewalk. The blue line is that exact same path, we're just walking around the sidewalk with the geode connected to the iPhone. And that data is all within 30 centimeters RMS. The green line was when we connected to an N-trip server and we got about 20 centimeters of reliable data. So it becomes very noticeable very fast in the project, the advantages of using a dedicated submeter receiver. Now we're gonna talk about some affordable mapping solutions some software that you could use with the hardware. Yeah, so the first thing we want to talk about today is, is our software. We're going to introduce several today, but um, our software is called Uinta. It's super easy to use, and it's going to be something that is going to work for a lot of the applications that you guys have out there. So. Um, one thing is that we have, we have a picture here with our Mesa 3. Again, we, we are the manufacturer of rugged tablets, and it works very well on our Windows 10 platform, which is the Mesa 3, and uh, go into a little bit more of that. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and the reason we produce this software is, obviously, we have customers who have a need out there. Many of them can find third-party solutions, but 
we also have a responsibility to be able to know what we're talking about when we're producing these products. So we produce hardware that can capture positions. We produce obviously the platforms that you run your software on, and we even have produced the software product that can give you a complete solution out of the box if needed. UIT is designed to be sort of a flex flexible object and record-based data collection software. You can capture spatial and non-spatial records. You can be using you can use this for capturing medical records, or you could be using it to map sprinkler heads, things like that. The software is kind of unique in that it has multiple views. There's a map view, a records view. We have a card view that shows the data that's captured in the database, and even a list view, kind of like a spreadsheet. Data can be imported and exported in several different formats, KML, shapefiles, Excel, and others. There's also a report writer for generating reports that you could send to a customer. Uh, we also build into it the ability to create different forms and templates that can be shared with other users. And one of the things that I, one of the things I really like about Uinta is the ability for anytime you need to collect data of any kind. If you if, if you could collect data on a clipboard, you could do it with Uinta, and it, it basically takes your you know record keeping and things like that that you would normally do manually and allows you to do it electronically. Um, right now, Uinta works on Windows 10. We've got an Android version that's under development. It's super easy to use. About five hundred dollars a year. Um, we have hundreds of people using it for utility mapping, resource mapping, irrigation assets. Like I said, anything, anything where you need, where you could traditionally use a pen and paper, you can put together a form in Uinta and then tie that form down to spatial data. It makes it really easy to do. Probably ninety-five percent of what most people need to do. So. Uh, again, Windows 10 and Android uh, coming soon. So another nice feature of this product is that subscription actually gives you two licenses. So you have one license you can run on a desktop and a second license for your field work. Makes it very helpful and efficient to pr produce your projects and also capture data in the field. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to show you some other software packages. Uh, these next few examples are, are very popular. They're well established in the GIS world. Uh, I guess most people in that industry are very familiar with Esri and their products. Uh, the most popular one out there is probably called this one here, Collector. Uh, it's a field app client for mapping and editing published map files that are published to the internet through ArcGIS Online. This, it has an annual subscription, about $500. That's what they call their creator license. Uh, and it's, it's really designed for large enterprise operations where you may have a, a large company or an industry or government entity where you have a GIS manager, you have GIS designers who create the maps, and then you have field workers who go out and capture or edit the data that's, that's generated out of the field. So it's really a, a good, solid, reliable map object-based product. And Esri makes another product that's sort of the other side of the coin, which is ArcGIS Survey 123. This is more of a forms-based software, same infrastructure, distributed as an enterprise product. Uh, this is kind of neat because it uses the XLS form format, so the data can be exported and even brought in as Excel files to create new projects. Its typical uses are, are things like, it was used on the US Census, for example, this most recent one. It's used in a lot of humanitarian aid projects and other citizen science projects. The idea is to create very simple forms for quick data collection. Now, as we also just recently introduced ArcGIS field maps, this is gonna be replacing Collector and a number of other Esri apps. They're merging their mapping, editing, their viewer or explorer product, and their navigation apps together into a single app. Pricing will be the same. The infrastructure will work the same way, but uh, this is gonna be the new replacement for Collector, and it's got some really neat new features. And of course, all of these run on Google Android devices and on iOS devices. One of the other ones that we have a lot of people using that's a little bit more affordable than some of those is Mapit GIS. This one is single layer editing and mapping within projects. Um, and it does elevations really well. This one is only 18 bucks. It's not 18 bucks a year, it's just 18 bucks one time. So it's kind of nice. Um, you know, so some people have different budgetary needs and you know, every product just aren't gonna work for them. This one is super affordable and you know, a lot of 
we have a lot of customers using this in geology, mining, uh, mapping harbors and marinas, a bunch of different natural resource and uh, utility applications all the way around. Another one, this one is actually free. It's called FW Maps. It's a, it's a nice basic app for points, lines, areas. Um, it's compatible with shape files and MBT tiles. Uh, lots of people using this for utility location, basic natural resource mapping. It's just a nice way, nice way to go when you don't have very complex needs. Again, this one is on Android only. Um, but it works really well. Yeah, it's a good solution if you have a price constrained project or a short project to complete, not a lot of complex data or forms or things like that. If you just need to essentially bang out some points and get them to someone. Yeah. Now there's also some consumer products that people have uh, been using in the professional world that work quite well. This one is a very popular one for people who like to hike, like to go camping, things like that. It's called Gaia GPS. It's available on both Android and iOS products. It's basically just a consumer-oriented consumer -oriented trail and site mapping product. Uh, there's two versions. There's a $20 annual subscription, and then there's a premium version, which I've seen professional users buy the premium version because it allows you to publish multiple maps and send them to different people. It's good for trail mapping, capturing campsites, but uh, for a lot of the professional users out there, this is a great field scouting tool. So this may not be your primary data collection tool, but this is your great tool to go out and do some scouting and figure out a project budget, capture the general information about a project. Yeah, lots of backcountry users and uh, you know, off-road guides and stuff like that are using Guy. Yes. Yep. Onyx is another one. Um, they have a, a series of mapping and navigation apps. They have some that are, you know, kind of specifically for hunting. Some that are for off-road four by four stuff and people using the backcountry. It's a it's a real nice way to go. I've used this one personally many times in the past. It has a great coverage of private property. So that when you know if you if you need to hunt on private property, if you need to hunt next to public property, it's easy to tell where, where stuff is not fenced, where you enter public property or private property. So it's a really nice way to go. Not too expensive. You can get it state by state for about 30 bucks a subscription. Or you can, you know, if you're ranging all over the place, you can get all 50 states for $99 a year. So uh, very, very nice, uh, easy to use. Again, it's available on both Android and the, uh, for iOS as well. And this is obviously not a comprehensive list of all the software options that are available out there for people to use. But these are ones that we have found work well with a lot of our customers' jobs. We have customers that we know are using these. They work well with the geode, for example, our submeter receiver. So we like to mention them because they're very reliable products. But you can go out there and find lots of solutions. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about meeting budgets and economizing them, using the right tools for the job. And I, you know, I spent a long time in environmental consulting and um, oversaw quite a few projects for wetland delineation and things like that. So I've got a little example just to share with you about meeting some budgets and using those right tools. Let's say we, we have a field labor for a wetland delineation. It's 96 hours at 80 bucks an hour. So your person bills out at 80 bucks an hour. Um, and then you also need to do some analysis back in the office and you, you maybe 40 hours of of that at a hundred bucks an hour. But you can basically complete this project for about just under $12,000. Um, now, what if you were able to do this project for 50% off? Now, 50% off sounds like a lot um, of the field labor. Let's just, let's just look at the field labor. What if we could cut that in half by using the right tools for the job? And you might say, holy cow, man, that's a lot. Um, Cutting down 50% is not real realistic, but you know, if you're using the exact right tools that are purpose built for your job, it is actually pretty realistic. And our partners, um, Esri, and our other partner, EcoBot, they recently found out that they have they found a 50% reduction in wetland delineation time by simply using the right tools for the job. They have the right hardware and the right software, 
and they were efficiency. And rather than throwing a whole bunch of uh, man hours at something, um, if you invest in the right hardware and software, if you're using the right tools for the job, you can achieve those kind of gains. So let's see what happens with our uh, stuff, with our, with our example. Um, if we look at our previous total, it was just under $12,000. But what if we, we use the right tools for the job, we bought a geo, we bought some software at $500, and we were able to, to do what Esri and Ecobot did, and they saved 50% on field work by using the right tools. That cuts us down to a total of $10,140, which actually results in a savings or a profit of $1,540 more Plus, we then own that hardware and software that we can use on another project or that we can sell and recoup some of those costs. So, you know, using the right tools for the job are probably one of the best ways to meet your budget. I know a lot of times with environmental consultants, people are a little bit loath to invest in some new capital expenditures and things like that. But if you get them in and it makes you more efficient, then you are gonna save money. And so just something else to consider as you as you move through the various projects that you guys are involved in and things like that. Okay, uh, thanks Ken for that example. And that's important for people to think about that. Uh, think about the project holistically and think about how it's going to benefit both your customer and you. So now we're gonna close out here. We're gonna go over some, some hacks, some tips, some tricks. Remember, we want to talk about ways to do things on a budget. In other words, ways to spend our money efficiently. So we're going to show you some examples of, of tools and solutions that we found that work really well. So here's a typical example of a person doing a map, a submeter mapping project. You've got the, the geode receiver, it's mounted on a pole here. You've got a data collector of some sort attached to the pole, and you're going out and capturing points. Now, using a pole is a good idea. Why? because it allows us to ensure that we're setting up the receiver directly over the object we're trying to capture. It also allows us to control the height of the objects that we're capturing. So we pay attention to our vertical component if that's necessary. But you don't necessarily need to go out and spend a lot of money for an expensive, what some people might say is an expensive pole. Sure, you might wanna have a good tool, but you might need to economize for the job. So we found another solution. This is a camera monopod. Now the geode receiver actually has a quarter 20 thread hole on the bottom, which is a camera thread. So it matches up with things like a camera monopod or even a camera tripod. What's neat about this product is this collapses down to just a couple feet in length and you could use it such as a, uh, a backpack pole with uh, any backpack. Yeah, you can, just you can just drop it in any backpack that you already have. You don't have to have a purpose built backpack or collecting submeter data, you just put it in, in your backpack, hold it in your hand, however you want to use it. Some of these are, you know, they, they pack down to about 18 inches and they extend to as much as six and a half feet. So, you know, it just depends on which one you buy, but they're available on Amazon for between 15 and $25 all the time. So a, a real nice way to uh, save some money on some, some hardware there if you're not going to be a really tough user and need some kind of uh, range pull. Yeah, exactly. So now here's another example. You could use a backpack on the left, but you might be working in an area where you're going through some brush, you're going around a lot of trees, and you don't want to be hitting that antenna against objects and getting snagged. You need to move around, you need more flexibility. So on the right, we have this example we just sort of nicknamed the parrot because it sits on your shoulder like a parrot for a pirate. So we're all GPS pirates out there. But what's cool about this product is it's basically a GoPro camera mount and it will attach to any backpack strap. So it's a nice, affordable, convenient solution. We've done a lot of testing with this configuration. We have a number of customers who are using this setup. We found that your head doesn't cause too much of an issue with positioning. There's lots of sky still exposed. Uh, likewise, it's good ergonomically when you're standing next to an object that you want to map, say you have that receiver sitting on your left shoulder where, where your right heel is, is exactly vertically below that receiver. So it's a good, easy way to capture points. And if you pay attention to your posture, you're going to have generally the same height all the time. 
it's a it's a really nice way to go. You know, if you, th if you think about some of our users are in the Pacific Northwest and they are literally, you know, just climbing through all kinds of vines and ferns and everything, and stuff catching on. This is a super easy solution, low profile, and you know, those those kind of conditions aren't just in the Pacific Northwest. You know, everybody gets into position, you know, just stuff like that where they don't want to be snagging stuff. And that's a great solution for that. Now, another thing that you can look at is we, we have an external antenna for the geode. And so you see this one, this is actually a small magnetic antenna. And what it essentially does, it just moves the antenna from the geode to this remote location. It's connected by a cable of about six to 10 feet. And it works really well for even more low profileness. And uh, you can mount it just about anywhere. It mounts on magnetic mounts, so you can mount it on a strap like this. You can mount it on top of a car. We have customers that mount them on top of tractors where they're doing utility clearing, where you know branches and all kinds of trees are falling on top of the car, and they don't want to be smashing the geode if it were sitting up there. But this can get you can get away with a little bit more of that. So um, just another option as, as far as something really low profile. Yeah, we have a number of customers using this in the logging industry. And rather than put a, a receiver, $1,800 or so receiver, up on the roof of a, a harvester, they just put a, an inexpensive antenna. So should the unfortunate happen, a log or a branch come by and crash down on top of the antenna, it's less, less expensive, basically, to replace it. That's a more affordable solution uh, to deal with you know, environments where things could get damaged easily. Now, some people will say, that's great. These are all different ways to carry the product, but I need to keep a hand free. I'm, maybe I'm doing uh, test holes. I need to dig, or I just want to be able to carry all the solution lighter, easier fashion. So we came up with this solution here. We took our geode and we came up with a, a tray to attach it to. And then we worked with a company that makes mounts for smartphones, all different kinds of smartphones, things that will hold your smartphone in your car, on your bike. Uh, handlebars uh, on a motorcycle, that type of thing. And we took this tray that we made for the geode and attached it to these various smartphone trays. And now you have an all-in-one handheld solution. Now what's nice about this is this gives you the convenience of a handheld GPS or GNSS data collection device. But it comes with the additional benefit of you can choose what smartphone interface you use. If you want to use an iPhone, great. If you want to use an Android device, you can do that too. Yeah, it, it works for a lot of people. The nice thing is it's a little bit future-proof too because the geode will work with any kind of Bluetooth connection. So, you know, 10 years from now, as long as you still have a Bluetooth connection, you know, you could be running iOS 600 or whatever and, and the geode is still gonna work with it. So. You don't get outdated by your operating system the way that you can with other uh, single handheld devices like this. Yeah, and we these mounts are, are very inexpensive. It's a, a simple mounting system for a smartphone. And if you think about some of these dedicated all-in-one devices that are out there, they're great, they work. Uh, but think about, you probably all can think of examples of people you've worked with that they may buy one of these things for a project and they set it aside for a few months or they come back to it the next season or the next year and now they're trying to figure out how to get the software updated, how to get it to interface with, with their desktop software. Uh, but like Ken said, this gives us the ability to somewhat future-proof the solution in the field at a very affordable price too. Now here's another really neat feature. Uh, the geode, not only does it have attachment point on the bottom that fits under a camera mount, and we ship it with an adapter that fits all the standard GIS survey poles, but it also has two more attachment points on it for RAM mounts. The RAM is probably the biggest producer of mounting solutions for vehicles, boats, cars, trains, ATVs, just about anything you could think of. So we designed the geode to be able to attach to their adapters. So here's an example of the geode bolted onto an ATV. And you can get these, these RAM parts very inexpensively from partners, resellers to sell the geode. You can also get it online from Amazon or from other sources, even at web stores, things like that. Uh, and about 85 or 90% of all the products they build 
will attach to the GM. So there's almost no limit to mounting solutions for this. Works really easy, makes it easy to take it out in the field and drive right over the top of whatever you need to map if that's an option for you. Um, we're noticing a bunch of questions coming in, keep them coming. We're almost, we're almost done with this. So, you know, feel free to, to ask us some more questions. So, let me tell you about this, this other hack. One of our customers, a federal agency up in Alaska, you know, sometimes the federal agencies have a hard time requesting money and, and getting money for things. And so, you know, one of these one of these managers came up with this great idea that we call the PVC pipe hack, and he basically took three foot lengths of PVC pipe, put a cap on it, and then drilled a hole through that with the one quarter by twenty inch bolt, and he basically made his own range poles out of the PVC pipe that cost him about five bucks a piece, and then just uses that in a backpack. And he he did this for his entire crew, and they're using geos on top of PVC pipes uh, allowed him to do it at a super affordable price without breaking his budget. So it's kind of a little little hacker that you know I can respect because he made it work. And so you know as as you use some of these tools, a lot of it is really just that. What how can you be creative to make some of these things work? And you know some of the, some of that has to do with buying lower priced uh, software. Maybe it's lower priced hardware. Maybe it's making a hack like this that enables you to get the job done without breaking the bank. You know, I think we've all been in some kind of position where we think it's going to cost X amount, and next thing we know, it's way more than that. We've got to find some places to save money. Well, think about these as, as some places where you can save money and meet those budgets. And I uh, hope this has been helpful for you today. We're going to go into the question and answer portion here. And John, if you want to start with some of these questions that we've had coming in and just go from there. Sure. Feel free to keep asking questions too. Sure. Uh, let's see. Let's look up here. Um, all right. Then, so there's a question about Uinta. So it's like, can I import data layers to my map in Uinta? Yes, you can. Uh, Uinta takes lots of different uh, file format imports. We call them layers or records because it may be a feature or a spatial piece of data, or it may be a non-spatial database where it's just objects or records. But yes, you can do that. And we can show you how to do that. In fact, on our website, we have in our support section video that walks through all the steps as to how to use, product, to use the product. So yes, it's definitely possible. All right. Um, let's see. Is there a way to try the hardware and software in a demo environment? Yes. Um, we do demos here at Juniper Systems. We can we can send you one for to use. Uh, we, uh, we also have a variety of resellers and retailers that have demos. So either we can figure out a way to get you a demo, whether it's direct from us or from one of our resellers. Uh, we're happy to do that. We don't want you to make a huge capital expenditure without uh, trying it out first sometimes. So that's that is an option. Great. Uh, someone was asking what's the battery life on the geo. That's a good question. Uh, it's a very small, lightweight product. It's only four inches to the side, a little over an inch thick. So it's nice and compact. It's got a really good sized battery inside there. Uh, the battery will run 10 and a half to 11 hours in the field. And since we charge over USB, you can use any uh, battery pack that you can get at any big box electronic store and virtually have almost unlimited ba battery supply uh, runtime for the product if needed. Okay, next question. How does forest cover, deep canyons, et cetera, affect uh, the submeter GPS? What can I reasonably expect where I can't get a signal from a survey grade GPS system? You know, using any GPS system is going to be very dependent on, on your terrain and conditions. So, uh, you know, we, we've had really good luck with the geode works really well in, in canyons and under deep forest cover. We've had it tested at the U.S. Forest Service um, submeter GPS test course. Um, it tested really well. Um, that that data is actually available on our blog. So if you want to check that out, um, it, it works really well. It's gonna, you know, if you can't get any signals down there, you're obviously not going to get any signal. But most places you can still get a signal with the geode, and uh, yeah, very dependent. But I think it should work pretty well for you for the most part. Good deal. Seeing a lot of questions asking about that tray image. Uh, 
people are asking, will it work with an iPad? Will it work with an iPhone? It's kind of cool because it's a two-piece solution. There's there's a tray component that attaches to the geode. It basically is just a, a very simple bent piece of plastic, for lack of a better description, that has some attachment point mounting holes on it. And the company that we work with that makes these smartphone mounts, uh, they also make mounts for things like an iPad, um, for pretty much all the major uh, smartphones that are out there. Uh, we can take a mount that we made ourselves that we provide for the Mesa 3, and you can attach your geo to that, even in portrait or landscape view. So there's lots of ways to do this, and we found that you can pretty much use it with just about every product out there based upon these adapters and holders that are made by this company that we work with. And we'll get back to you folks and put that information out as to where you can get that. We're looking through some questions here. Yeah, just one second. Let's see. All right. So there's some questions about, you know, will there be a dual frequency version of the geo planned, other things like that. Uh, we can't necessarily talk about product that's under development that hasn't been promoted yet, but we're looking to provide more scalable solutions in the future. So I'd, I'd keep watching out for that. Yeah, so another one says, is 60 centimeters of accuracy for the geo that only with real-time correction or post-processing? I work in the Arctic where there are no base stations nearby that I can tie into. What accuracy can I expect? Um, you can expect basically the same. I, if you're working in the Arctic and you're far in the north, I suggest getting the multi-GNSS version of the geo. Um, it sees the Russian satellites, the Indian satellites, the yeah, European, well, European, European satellites, and all of those are basically aimed at the northern hemisphere. And so when you have all of those data points in the sky, you're going you're gonna to get more reliable uh, measurements and so um, the answer is yes should work well in the in the in the arctic um, and i would err on the side of getting the multi-gnss version that sees all of those different constellations yep well, there are a couple of questions about software uh, someone asks uh, are you doing testing with avenza maps that's a great product actually avenza is a really good product we've we've worked with them for a long time it works well with the geode uh, that's that's a product that's good for capturing points and also it's a great tool to distribute maps or use maps that are published by other people. So that's one solution we know it works with. Also, someone mentioned uh, Effigis. We have been working with Effigis for a long time. So the geode is post-processable using their EasyTag field data collection software and their EasyServe post-processing engine. And Effigis, uh, they have a new product. They have a product called OnPause Collect, which runs on Android, and a companion product called OnPause Cloud, which is the web client that you use for managing projects for uploading and downloading. So if you're looking for a post-processing solution, we found that their product works really well. All right, let's go through the list. Um, so one question is, are you aware of any solutions that easily combine and sync the GNSS data from the geo with data from other external sensors in real time? I do know that we have some GPR customers that are using some of that, some of that. I think they're using some proprietary software. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with our UNSA software is integration with lasers. And so that's that's something that's kind of on the uh, on the horizon there. John, are you aware of any other? Yes, uh, pipe locators. People were asking about the geo. There, there are some uh, manufacturers of underground locators that already have interface in their software between the geode and their underground locators. And we're also looking at adding that capability to the geode, like you said, along with laser range finders and a few other devices. Or to UINTA, yeah. Excuse me, to UINTA. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's one there talking about, uh, as far as the accuracy on the geode, the precision. The precision we advertise is using the SBAS corrections. So it's 30 centimeters RMS or 60 centimeters 2D RMS. When you turn on the geode or any other GNSS receiver in a similar class and you're running it autonomously without any sort of other correction source, then you're looking at a few meters of accuracy. And that's because there's some inherent sources of error when dealing with GPS and all the other constellations. Uh, you can post-process the data. 
Uh, we also can use it real time with end trip solutions, which we will see a slightly better solution, uh, more in the 20 centimeter range. With uh, post processing, depending upon the post processing engine you're using and the procedure you're using in the field, you can process down to a few centimeters or a couple of inches, basically the size of the geode itself. Um, price range of the geode, the geode, geode starts around $1,600, $1,700 and goes up from there to about $2,200 just depending on the features. There are several different models available and it just kind of depends on what you need. Um, you know, we can talk to, talk to Juniper, talk to some of our, our resellers about what they suggest based on your specific circumstances and we can figure out something there. Anyway, um, that's about it as far as uh, majority of the questions and we thank you for joining us today feel free to reach out with any other further questions you have uh, appreciate you showing up and, and interacting with us we'll talk to you later yeah thank you very much for for joining us in this discussion and if we weren't able to answer your question online we are going to send out responses to all the questions that we have received and we do thank everyone for participating and uh look forward to hearing from you folks in the future thank you very much